And you're actually, I guess, in the medium to longer term, constructive on this sector. Does the, uh, I, I guess, element of government support that's been pledged help you? And is that what's driving an improvement in sentiment? I think government support is certainly necessary, especially in the case of Evergrande, to ensure an orderly restructuring. But I think that's more of a medium term factor. The single most important driver is to really look at what's persistent. And I think here, we really have to focus on the urbanization rate. So just to put that in perspective, you know, Japan's urbanization rate is around 90 percent. The United States is hovering around the 80s. And China just hit 60 percent. What that translates into in terms of real numbers is two times the entire Brazil households will be moving from the rural areas to the cities. So if you think about that, that's still a huge opportunity, you know, for property sector and companies to actually thrive. So I think there will definitely be winners as well as losers from this current shakeout. One of the winners or the sectors of winners that you see is really pretty evident in this Bloomberg TV uh, chart. You take a look at the elements of Asia credit that is getting a boost and it's pretty clear that high grade uh, Asian dollar bonds are showing more resilience while you take a look at single B just tumbling there, right? When you take a look at the next few years ahead, if the government is clearly not going to step in, even if the bar is, <laughs> the, the, the sort of stakes are very high, does that mean you see a shakeout of the weaker players? Is that actually maybe credit positive because what remains are companies that are being forced to be fiscally prudent? I think that's a really good point. You know, the government is trying to really thread a fine line here. So on the one hand, they really want these really risky real estate developers to deleverage. And that's what the three red lines were all about from a policy standpoint over the last nine months. But on the other hand, they also want to make sure that this industry, which represents you know, about 28% of the entire economy, continues to be healthy. And so the government is here, I think, to ensure that there is an orderly restructuring for one of the largest property sector companies in all of the country. Um, at the same time, the government does not want to promote moral hazard and to you know, make sure that most of these companies um, that will continue to, to actually you know, do good corporate governance and actually take on a prudent amount of leverage. And haven't we seen in the past when it comes to Beijing that any time this deleveraging effort actually starts to risk hurting growth, that they back off, right? So what are you taking away from the Politburo meeting, not to mention the triple R cut? Indeed, you know, I think the triple R cut in of itself is probably not as significant as the signal. And I think over the next nine months, the overall trend growth of the US of the China economy is probably slightly below the kind of five percent rate that they're looking for. And as such, we expect monetary policy to continue to be loosening. And so when you put all of this together, while the government cannot usher liquidity to the weakest players, they definitely can provide liquidity to the overall system. And that means that, you know, companies that you mentioned that are, you know, solid investment grade, that are really healthy, can actually go out there and consolidate some of the weaker players, as well as buy some of these asset sales that are going to be on the block. Theresa, let me ask you a broader macro question, especially with the incredible strength that we've seen in the Chinese yuan recently, because right now, China's security journal coming out and saying that analysts are seeing further yuan strength in the short term. So we have seen this policy divergence now with the Fed starting to taper or wanting uh, to taper even faster, and then the PBOC actually signaling more easing. Where does that leave the yuan? That is absolutely the most important question. So... If we step back and actually look at the current regime, the renminbi is actually being managed to a to a what I call a managed float. So it's not pegged, but it's actually managed to a basket of its trading partners. So U.S. dollar is just one of the many currencies. So yes, absolutely right. U.S. policy is actually going to be a little bit more hawkish, but at the same time, none of the other trading partners that China has really can afford to really be, you know, stepping on, on the brakes at this point. And so we actually think that the regime, the currency regime that China is currently in, will provide it with sufficient policy room to accommodate China actually zagging when the rest of the world, especially the U.S., is zagging.